All right. Hello, Slash. Uh, my name is Tatiana. Um, I'm an investor with Chinevik. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Chinevik is a multi-stage investor. We invest across um, US and Europe in climate, software, and healthcare. Today, as you know, we're going to talk about how we can fuel climate tech companies. Um, and with me, I have two people that I am fortunate to work with um, and that I admire a lot. We have Harold Mix, the founder of Vargas and Altor, and we have Martin Lievet, um, the founder of ERA. Warm welcome. Um, so I wanted to kick off this discussion with asking you, Harold. I'm sure many people that are listening here today want to know what the driving force is behind your work. Obviously, you've built some of the most ambitious climate tech companies in Europe the mm. past decade. So what's driving your, your work? I think it's, uh, you know, to really, I guess, seeing the world around us that, uh, you know, climate change is something we need, really need to take very seriously. And, uh, and at the same time, you know, it's really about curiosity and being an eternal optimist. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, going back to having, you know, invested in private equity for the past 30 plus years, um, you know, with a lot of focus on more traditional industries, manufacturing, etc. And, and I think that I feel very privileged, you know, having built that background for a long period, already started actually in 2007 to invest in, uh, in a battery business. But that background has, I think, given me a chance to, you know, to really see firsthand, you know, what's happening in different industries. And over the past decade, you know, that has really intensified. And I think what's, and it's also about getting older, you know, if you're 60 plus, you start thinking about your legacy. Yeah. And, uh, and I feel fortunate being able to sort of take, call it, you know, the private equity experience, you know, combining that with, you know, thinking about entrepreneurship, you know, how to build companies, which is really difficult, but it's also really, really fun. And because uh, I think that this, you know, how we can connect, you know, some of the parts of private equity with infrastructure financing is really a key to unlocking the trillions of dollars that we need to, uh, you know, to really build and scale some of these companies. And why do you think Europe needs companies like Northvolt, Stegra? Because I think what we need is that we basically need to mobilize a lot of capital around the world. And I think to do that, you also need to demonstrate, you know, how to, basically how to, uh, you know, to unlock that capital. I think the challenge we have today is that, you know, VC is obviously, you know, critical in terms of building, you know, early stage companies. Then I guess you come to growth equity, you know, similarly. But most of that capital, I guess, is, is really focused or has historically been focused on, you know, more capital light opportunities. But if we're going to solve the climate crisis, it's actually a lot about hardware. You know, it's really about how do we reindustrialize huge parts of our economy, the steel industries, chemical industries. It's about, you know, renewable energy. How do we recycle textiles? How do we build, you know, heat pumps, etc. Yeah. So I think that, you know, that is really the challenge where, uh, you know, and to unlock that, I think you need great examples. And, uh, and I think a company like, you know, Stegra, which is building the first steel plant in Europe in 50 years and has been funded with, you know, 6 billion plus of, uh, of capital, including, you know, 2 billion plus of equity, you know, is a great role model for how we can do this. And if we can't unlock this capital, it's going to be very difficult to finance the transition. And I think another point, we talk a lot about the funding gap. Uh, obviously, you, you have the early stage companies that can get VC capital, but you don't really have anything that can come in after growth. Um, and I think you've mentioned the Mario Draghi report uh, in an article you wrote that I read last night, um, which is about you know, Europe lagging behind the US and China. So how do you think about Europe um, funding these like transformative, hard to abate projects? I, mean, I, I think it's. Uh, I think to some extent, I think it's important to know that, you know, these. I guess these investments. If you take, for instance, you know, Stengra, the six billion euros. If you look at sort of domestic funding, uh, you know, for that historically, you know, up until very late, it was 15 million euros out of six billion. Then, fortunately, we were able to get some additional support from the innovation fund. But, but I think that the most important is actually two things. You know, we have a price of carbon in the ETS system. And ETS pricing is going to increase over time as we basically 
abolish subsidies to abating industries. So we have that, which is really, really important. Then we have CBAM, which is basically also going to protect industries, so basically create a level playing field so you can produce somewhere else in the world, you know, based on lots of fossil um, imported into Europe. So I think those are key, but maybe the most important, I would say, is actually the corporations that is creating the demand side. Mm. Um, I think a lot of you probably know about you know, science-based targets. And uh, today, you know, the vast majority of the largest companies in the world have signed up to the Paris Agreement, and that is creating the demand side of the equation. So, you know, obviously, I think Europe needs to make sure that you know, we have a level playing field. But I think fundamentally, you know, a lot of this is going to have to happen by mobilizing you know, real private capital. So more private capital, not really the government's... It's really, it's really about unlocking, you know, how can you get parts of infrastructure funding into this? Mm. And how can you get, you know, private equity type funding into this as well? With, you know, starting earlier on with, you know, with venture and growth and sort of connecting together. And uh, because it's so much money and it's also, uh, you know, it's a lot about hard assets. Yeah. Talking about funding, uh, Martin, you have raised almost 250 million euros um, in less than a year. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more about ERA and the problem you're solving? <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, she doesn't like carousels. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, for sure. I, I think some has dubbed ERA as uh, the Spotify or heat pumps, and I guess two reasons. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty yeah good. that's a good tagline. Yeah. Yeah. But it's Swedish roots, but also the way that we provide our services uh, with a monthly payment model. But I think you can say that ERA's mission is really to accelerate the electrification of residential heating in Europe, making sure that consumers, they throw out their inefficient, expensive and dirty oil and gas boilers and replace that with intelligent electrical heat pump and other clean energy tech. So why are we doing this? I think an interesting fact is that the energy and the emissions that we generate by heating our homes for space heating and for our bathrooms and kitchens represents around 10 to 20 percent of all emissions. It's the third biggest emission source, and you never hear much talk about it. And the penetration of electrical heat pumps is 60 percent in Scandinavia, in the Nordic region, while it's between 1 and 5 percent in the rest of continental Europe. But I think that's really why we're doing this. But there's another important thing why we do this as well. The good thing is consumers will save a tremendous amount of money when they make the switch from fossil-based heating systems to electrical heating systems. Emissions, they will actually reduce by 75 to up to 100 percent if you use renewable energy. So I think this is a super impactful way. And I think what's unique with ERA is that we, we have a direct-to-consumer approach and we combine it with a high degree of vertical integration. So we do our own products, own manufacturing, run our own sales and installation and providing a super smooth, hassle-free transition for Europe's households. And we do this by offering it for a monthly fee. So you don't have to pay 15, 30,000 euro up front. You start to save money from the very first day. So I think in a nutshell, that's ERA. And uh, I always say that if there's one thing I want everyone to bring with them today is that this transition is really the most impactful change European households can do. It's, uh, it's the most scalable and affordable technology available. And replacing one gas boiler with one heat pump equals taking two cars off the street forever. Mm. But I think that's ERA and what we are up to. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's a fantastic consumer offering. Um, as an investor, obviously, you think about the complexity. It's not a, an average software investment, right? It's pretty complex that you're doing your own heat pumps and you own the whole, the whole value chain, really. How has your fundraising journey been so far? What type of, like, capital have you brought in? The smart capital. Yeah, smart capital from obviously. different sources. But <laughs> we, we raised around 240 million euro in, in equity yeah. funding, so it's uh, A and B. And we also have debt commitment uh, for, for pioneering, basically, securitization of, of heat pumps in Europe. 
But I think we were fortunate enough from the very early stage to bring in a, a very diverse uh, investor base. I think you would say that some would be, you know, very early stage investors. Some are more growth. I think Shinovic, you are an investor, and I would categorize you there. And then more later stage, like Timasek from, uh, from Singapore. So I think with that diverse base, mm. I really think that we have very broad skill set, and we also have investors that will support us for the longer journey. And I think that's very important. This climate transition is nothing you do overnight. You really have to have this uh, long-term mindset to it. You also had a very supportive first investor. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's super important for us. I think we were fortunate, uh, fortunate to, to get a you know, very strong and, and flying start. Yeah, you need that, that upfront capital. And I think that's yeah, also yeah. why you, know, our, I mean, you guys can create those types of companies that need that upfront capital because you also have that, that mandate, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think just another thing that I'm curious to hear about, and I know a bit of this, but I think the audience is curious to hear about this, is how it was to raise debt um, and you know, the, the deal you have with with the um, BNP. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of early stage companies, they want to get to that stage, right? When you can get that type of access to capital, it's just so difficult. Mm -hmm. How was that process and what was the reason you could close that? Well, I think in general, our fundraising rests on a few pillars. I, I think first of all, we address a very concrete, simple to understand problem. Mm. And I think we also have a very clear plan of and a unique value proposition, how we solve that problem, and also a good plan for how we disrupt what is today a highly inefficient industry. And uh, I think that makes it very easy to people to understand yeah. what we are solving and, and how we're moving there. And but I think, can I say something? I mean, I think fundamentally, I think unlocking, you know, for that sort of consumer service, which is really, it's really an essential for the household, so basically, if you think about a heating system, yeah. you know, there's plenty of you know, receivable financing for car leases, etc. Yeah. And to some extent, you could say it's almost like a mortgage. Yeah. So I think you know, securitizing 20-year contracts <coughs> is actually, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And I think it's similar to what we talked about before in terms of you know, when you look at other types of projects. This is consumer, so obviously you, can't, you don't have any off-take contracts with lots of customers up front. But at the same time, you do have you know, the security, and it's really about you know, how, you can, how you can package that, uh, yeah. that part of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, both uh, Harl and I have invested in ERA, so I don't think you need to explain to us why you, know, you should invest in you. But how, uh, what has the feedback been from investors, given that this is not your typical VC growth case as you're vertically integrated? What has the feedback been? And why do you think investors want to back you versus not wanting to back you? Oh, I, I believe investors, they will, you know, look for an, a big market opportunity. And I think uh, the market we are approaching, it's, we're talking about 150 billion euro market every single year in the not too distant future. So it's a sizable market. I think you need a scalable business model. I think we, we've proven that uh, with our vertical integration, we can make this something much bigger than what is available today. And a clear path to profitability. But I think also from our side, when we were looking at investors, and I think we were quite selective in our outreach, I think we were looking for you know, like-minded investors. For us as a team, we really need a good cultural fit as well. I mean, what we're doing is not simple. We need to move fast and uh, you know, need the right experience and the like-minded uh, people there. Also, as I said before, we were looking for long-term investors. I think that's, that's really important for us. So uh, this is something we do for the long haul as a company. And uh, since we work across the value chain as well, uh, it's everything from, you know, fuel tech to go-to-market strategies, it's the industrial side with manufacturing. I think we, we were looking really for investors who can complement our team, providing advice, and I must say that we have very dedicated and highly engaged investors yeah. supporting us. I think also it's fair to say that some of the investors said, are you crazy? Why do you want to build a factory? Mm. <laughs> I, I mean, we were also in that camp in the beginning. I think, I think <laughs> so, you're also in that camp. Yeah. And, uh, so we got convinced. But, but at the same time, I think if you look at, I mean, you can take analogies with you know, Tesla or SpaceX. Mm -hmm. but, but I think fundamentally, if you're really looking to, and I guess the way that we try to approach investments, <laughs> 
is to sort of take a completely you know, white sheet of paper and to look at the entire value chain. And this whole project really started from two things, looking at a McKinsey slide on emissions in Europe mm. and realizing that, you know, what is, what's going on in this residential sector? Why is it such a large amount of emissions? Because coming from Sweden, Finland, where we have, you know, every house has a, no one has a gas boiler, mm. we didn't really get it. And then we said, why don't we look into that particular area, take a white sheet of paper, and I think what was really struck us after a while is that if you look at a typical installation in Germany, including VAT, it costs 30,000 euros. And then we said, OK, why don't we just like, pick apart the entire value chain? Let's start with the hardware. And then if you take it from a plumber, which is typically the way that it's distributed today, he probably pays like 9,000 for the piece of hardware. And then we started looking at it, and you know, lots of experts, value engineering, and he was probably the cost today, the industry has roughly 40% margins. So let's say that that was you know, 5,500. But if you did it at scale, and if you did it by you know, looking into the automotive industry, etc., we think we could probably make it for almost, not quite half, but 40% you know, cheaper. Mm -hmm. So then you say, OK, 30,000 minus VAT, 28 minus 4 is a lot of money mm. just to install it and sell it. So that's, but then we said, but if we can also manufacture it, and this is not like building a steel plant, this is like capital light manufacturing, you can really capture the entire margin of the business. And, uh, and I think that you know, for us, coming you know, slightly from private equity, you know, that kind of makes sense, building a factory. But it was really interesting to see how you know, the venture world, why would you do that? And, uh, but you know, hopefully it's going to be the, <laughs> the right decision. Yeah, but I think that's, a, you know, in climate tech, getting back to this, it's hardware. It's not just a great idea, software, services. Obviously, that's going to be a huge market as well. I'm not saying that. Mm. But there's a ton of money that needs to go into hardware, you know, grids, you know, other types of uh, picks and shovels uh, technologies. But I think the question is, like, where does that capital come from, right? Because there are very few investors that have the mindset that you have, but also that have that, like, that the pockets to, yeah. to, to make but those I, investments. But I think it's a little bit like, you know, it's like putting a square peg into a, into a round hole. Yeah. And, uh, but I think if we take, if we take Stegra as an, as an example, or formerly H2 Green Steel, so this basically started uh, from a dialogue with you know, one of our friends in the automotive industry, a German company with two letters. And, uh, and they basically have you know, adopted science-based targets you know, to be able to decarbonize their vehicles over time. And by 2030, they want to you know, reduce CO2 emissions by 30%. So what do you have in a car? I mean, you have electrification, and the battery is key to tailpipe emissions. But then I guess you have the product. And every car has a ton of steel, a ton of steel is two tons of CO2. And then they were looking at the industry, and besides you know, hybrid, which was a Swedish venture, basically the entire industry was sort of saying, too expensive, can't do it, hydrogen we can't produce. And uh, so essentially they went to us and said, you know, how do we fix this? So you can say in a way, the customer actually came with a problem, and they said, and if you are willing to do it, we actually will be able to enter into long-term contracts. You provide the supply, we provide the demand, the off-take contract, and by doing that, we were then able you know, to be able to create you know, or to unlock parts of the capital that wouldn't typically be available to a growth equity uh, company. Mm. So it's really about, you could say, on the unlocking project financing on that side of the equation, leveraging long-term off-take contracts, you know, leveraging credits, you know, credit agencies, etc. So that is a huge part of it, yeah. you know, maybe 50, 60 percent. Then the really, really difficult part is to raise the equity, mm. because it doesn't really fit. And, uh, and I guess the way that you know, we try to pitch it is that it's very similar to infrastructure, except, except, it, except it has growth equity returns, mm. which is not a bad... Uh, you know, bad combination. And why is that? Well, fundamentally, you know, from a commercial point of view, if you have long-term off-take contracts, providing certainty, pricing, margins, 
if you then use best available technology, it's not about like inventing new technology. The technology to actually you know, produce green steel by using direct reduction has been around for 50 years, except people have used natural gas instead of hydrogen for a simple reason, which is that hydrogen is too expensive. But fundamentally, you know, building on best available technology, combining with you know, commercial offtakes, the risk really comes down to execution, not to be underestimated. Mm. But fundamentally, by doing that, you can sort of then you know, be able to puzzle together different parts of capital. And if you look at the biggest shareholders in, uh, in Stegra, it's a combination of people like Just Climate, which is sort of a focused in this area on, on decarbonization. Uh, it's people like Temasek, you know, government of Singapore, Cinevic, you know, Altor, High24, which is coming more from the uh, infrastructure side, pension funds, etc. So I guess what we're doing is like a huge educational mission, you know, being able to sort of mobilize this capital, and then hopefully over time we'll be able to create an asset class which is really about industrial scaling. Mm. And I think a lot of the, you know, I'm sure a lot of interesting companies that's sitting in the room, you know, when you take it to the next level, it's sort of like how you can sort of, I think, uh, be able to piece that together and happy to yeah, give and anyone I, advice who, you know, wants to call, yeah, talk to I will ask that question to you now, because I think, th I mean, we have founders um, here listening to us and most of them don't have a Vargas um, pushing them and, and helping them to get to that first stage and they actually get access to this capital. I mean, you've been very helpful yeah. with that. Um, so how should those founders think about, you know, if you're building a business where you, it's all about offtake agreements, it's, about, it's not really about, you know, with Era where you actually get, I mean, you sell to customers, so you have revenue today, you're at 100 million even, you rose revenue already a year mm -hmm. into building Era. It's quite different with uh, Stegra or Northvolt. Yeah. So how do you think founders here should think about that if you don't have, you know, 100 million that comes in from investors from day one? Well, uh, <laughs> it's a difficult question. I think you need to. No, but I, but I think that there are pools of capital that's starting. And I don't think you need, I don't think you need 100 million euros mm. to get started. But, but I think the way to think about it is that a lot of it is about unlocking these types of markets. It's about creating you know, intimate customer relationships. Mm. So another example would be you know, Syre, which is basically looking to, to recycle polyester and then basically put it back into the value chain again. And it's, it's actually not that dissimilar. You know, it's about you know, developing a new technology at sort of like pilot you know, level, demo, etc. But then it's really about doing exactly what Stegra has done. It's actually by starting with the customers. Mm. And if you can't get the customers, you probably shouldn't build a plant, <laughs> which we have seen in uh, another That's very situation good advice. called Circulos, uh, which actually we invested at Altor because we think that eventually you will get the customers. Mm -hmm. But it really starts with understanding the customer's issue. And then maybe the first investors should actually be maybe a combination of you know, some private capital. But think about how you are actually helping you know, your customers to solve their problem. And I think there is actually more, you know, more willingness to invest than you think by you know, large industrial conglomerates like you know, Siemens, ABB, etc. So think a bit creatively about whose problem am I actually trying to solve yeah. and how can I tap into that and then uh, you know, try to find some other curious, uh, you know, optimistic uh, yeah. souls. Yeah, I think governments uh, can do a piece yeah, in this a as well. Yeah, too, yeah. And I think regarding governments, you have operations in, in Germany, in Italy, in the mm -hmm. UK. What do you think is important to get from those respective governments to, to essentially help you build the, the business you're building? I think they, they play an important role. It's also up to us in the industry to really do something, yeah. build awareness. But I think policymakers, they make a difference, whether it's on national level or the European level. But I think if I take our industry, it doesn't have to cost much money. There are very simple solutions to really you know, make the transition happen. And I now need to say that our value proposition is fantastic. Consumers will save 40, 50% on their energy bills. Who could say no to it? Mm -hmm. Still, people are not aware of it. And I think we have a, not a level playing field in Europe. You can say that fossil fuels have been artificially low priced. If you take the UK market, 
The environmental tax on electricity is actually higher than the gas price itself, so it does, doesn't really foster the right behavior. In Italy, one part of the government, they use the, the funding to subsidize heat pumps, while the other side, they still subsidize new gas boilers being installed. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Very simple things can do and shift taxation. I also think, you know, a clear and consistent messaging about subsidies, bans, uh, carbon taxes. With every election, there is, you know, always uncertainty. Created. That's the challenge, right? We have the German election coming now yep. in the yep. beginning of yep. next year. And I think you also need uh, a few people to do this together. I don't think this is going to be, you know, one player takes all. I mean, no. there are great examples, companies like, you know, MPAL yep. coming from the solar side, you know, Einskema Fünf, etc. So I think there's, there's plenty of room because I think today, you know, for every heat pump sold in Europe, there is still, I think, six, six gas boilers. Yes. In Sweden, it took 10 years to basically get rid of every single, you know, fossil based heating system. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that, why shouldn't that be able to happen in Europe? It's probably a lot easier than getting every single car off the road. Yeah. Maybe as uh, the last uh, questions, we're getting to the end now. Martin, I'll start with you. What would be your advice to uh, founders or aspiring founders that want to build climate tech businesses? I think I should start with what Harad said. You know, be very clear about what problem you are solving for your customers. Uh, and for us, it's very simple, you know. How can you make customers save 40%, 50% of the heating bills? Work around that and you know, articulate a very unique value proposition for the customer. And I think you need to have clear milestones as well. We do this vertical integration, but throughout our journey, we've been super concrete about what are key milestones for us in every type of area or yeah. work stream and really deliver on that. And uh, I think you have to be fairly open-minded, test and learn. Very few things actually play out exactly as you expect them to do. And I think, don't give up then. Then you have to, you know, react to that and adapt. And I think speed is of essence here. Don't do everything. Really, you know, do, yeah. do the changes required. I think the team for us has been fundamental. We, we are, you know, we are really on the streets with our salespeople, our customer fronting installers. So it's, it's really a people business. And I think it's super important to build that team right from the beginning. And our mindset was that we don't build the team that we need just here. We looked a bit further ahead. You know, what is the team that's going to take us throughout the next three years? And you're going to spend more time with that team than anyone else in your life. So you, 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 know, you better build that team. And I think the first people joining on the journey, it's really important to be careful there. You know, they set the culture. They define the DNA of the company, which is very difficult to change at a, a later stage. And mm. I think hard work, you should expect that. Yeah. And I think you need to you know, be very clear with your, your founding team as well. Mm. That, uh, that is you know, what it means mm. to build a business. Super rewarding, but hard work. Yeah, thank you. I have two questions for you, Harald. Yeah. Number one is obviously uh, your advice to founders in the audience. So I'll yeah. start with that. Okay. No, but, but I think this, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, understanding the customer. It really starts there. But then I think it really comes back to also understanding in detail, you know, sort of like uh, Elon Musk's first principles, really, really understanding the entire value chain yeah. and what you can do. I mean, obsessing about, you know, the details of the cost structure, looking for which, you know, Martin, no, I, I love to uh, challenge him on. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Where is the waste? So I think really obsessing about making sure that you will have a, you know, a competitive position long term. And, uh, and then I think it's, it's all about, you know, execution and team and culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so totally agree with Martin on that. And last question. I mean, you're the founder yeah. of Era uh, Northvolt Stegra. What's next? <laughs> Uh, I feel I have plenty to do, <laughs> so <laughs> I think maybe, I think focus uh, yeah. is a good thing. So if, I think that, yeah. if you would start something new in the heart debate space, what would, you, what, what would that be? Can we you know, urge someone in the audience to maybe Go start something? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but, but I think that there is, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the agri space, which I think is, is pretty difficult. Uh, you know, recycling areas, 
I mean, there's other types of materials, chemicals, etc. But I think in the Nordics, we have some interesting competitive advantages that we should play on. We have great access to renewable energy. We have lots of rivers, you know, huge amounts of storage capacity. So I think leveraging, you know, some of the core industries that we have. So. Great. And we're on time. Thank you, everyone, for coming and listening. And thank you, Martin and Harald. Thank you. <laughs>